Videos like this are made possible by the generous support of patrons like Olaf. Thanks, Olaf. For All Mankind is an Apple TV Plus show in which the Soviet Union beats the United States to landing a man on the moon, and it explores all the ripple effects this divergence in the timeline would have. The main one being that Congress gets drunk and adds a zero to NASA's budget. With the third season just getting started though, I thought I'd talk about something in the last season which has kind of bothered me ever since I watched it. And that's Pathfinder, a nuclear powered second generation space shuttle. Now this was a really cool scene, but it got me thinking about how a nuclear space shuttle is a terrible, terrible idea. Don't get me wrong, it makes sense in the context of the show, in which neither the Challenger disaster nor the Three Mile Island nuclear accident happened. It's believable that in this world, public safety concerns about nuclear power and the shuttle program would be lax enough for such a project to be greenlit. That doesn't mean Pathfinder isn't still just a catastrophe waiting to happen. First though, let's talk about what a nuclear rocket engine even is. A conventional chemical rocket engine burns fuel and oxidizer, creating an exothermic reaction and a controlled explosion that propels the vehicle. Although not a very efficient way of getting places, thus far they're the only engines we have with high enough thrust to lift both themselves and all their propellant out of Earth's gravity well. A nuclear thermal rocket on the other hand works by passing propellant through a nuclear reactor to heat it up to crazy high temperatures before expelling it out of a nozzle. Now, Although the thrust to weight ratio is traditionally much lower than chemical rockets, this form of propulsion is drastically more efficient. We measure how efficiently a reaction mass engine creates thrust with specific impulse, which for a rocket is directly proportional to the exhaust velocity. Specific impulse is just a measure of how much impulse, or change in momentum, an engine can generate per unit weight of propellant. It's measured in seconds, and essentially the higher the number, the more efficient the engine. Also, yes, I did say weight, not mass, that isn't a mistake. The RS-25 engine that powered the space shuttle and will also power NASA's upcoming SLS rocket has a specific impulse of 452 seconds in a vacuum, making it one of the most efficient chemical rocket engines in the world. In comparison, the NERVA, or nuclear engine for rocket vehicle application, built and tested by NASA in the 70s had a specific impulse of 841 seconds in a vacuum, almost double that of the RS-25. Now I'm not going to speculate about what propellant and reactor design Pathfinder uses, as that would be an entire video in and of itself. Its performance does seem to be much better than a solid core nuclear thermal rocket such as the NERVA could achieve, but let's just take the NERVA Alpha engine as a ballpark for the amount of uranium Pathfinder would be carrying. The NERVA Alpha was a smaller engine, actually designed to be launched by the space shuttle. It would have carried 60 kilograms of 92.5% enriched uranium. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but let's give a little context as to just how dangerous these substances are. On the 24th of January 1978, a Soviet reconnaissance satellite named Cosmos 954 re-entered the atmosphere over Canada. The problem was that the satellite was powered by a nuclear reactor containing 50 kilograms of uranium-235. Debris was scattered along a 600 kilometer path from Great Slave Lake to Baker Lake. 12 pieces were recovered, only accounting for an estimated 1% of the fuel on board. One piece had a radiation level of 5 sieverts per hour, and to put that in perspective, an exposure of 8 sieverts spells almost certain death, even with treatment. Thankfully, Northwest Canada is very sparsely populated, and nobody was injured or killed as a result of the accident. However, the cleanup operation cost 6 million Canadian dollars, of which the USSR eventually only paid 3 million due to the Space Liability Convention. Getting back to Pathfinder though, it launches from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. If an accident were to occur during launch, it could potentially be ejecting highly radioactive material over Los Angeles, which has a population of millions. Things could be even worse if Pathfinder disintegrated in the upper atmosphere. The Columbia disaster scattered debris across 5,000 square kilometers of Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. Now imagine if it had been carrying nuclear material. You're talking huge swathes of farmland and densely populated areas being contaminated. A character in the show understandably expresses concern about launching plutonium on a sea dragon from the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but somehow flying a nuclear-powered space shuttle over populated areas doesn't so much as raise an eyebrow. 
A much more sensible plan would take a similar form to NASA's original vision for the post-Apollo space transportation system, in which a space shuttle would rendezvous with a nuclear-powered tug which would transfer crew and cargo between low Earth orbit and lunar orbit. This way, you only need to take the risk of flying a nuclear reactor through Earth's atmosphere once, and from then on it's kept in space as far away from populated areas as possible. That probably wouldn't have made for quite as awesome a set piece for a TV show though, and Pathfinder absolutely follows the rule of cool, but it's still a god awful idea. A massive thank you to my patrons and donators for their generous support, and an extra special thank you to the amazing steak, Olaf Hammerhand, Dakota Clark, Lady Lagsalot, Lightning Gamer, Peter Lushtinet, Madzor, Dennis Klomp, Axel Jensen, Simone67, Scott Milligan, Elmac, and Jesse Smith.